Amen, amen. Hey, good morning. I want to welcome you to Arbor Heights Community Church. Uh, yeah, go ahead and sit. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And hope you've been enjoying some of the sun. I uh, hope you got a chance to get out this weekend, walk around a little bit. I don't know if you're like me. Um, I love the summer evenings where the temperature's kind of cooled down. Got a chance to walk last night. It was really beautiful. Some of that too. So, hey, uh, so excited you're with, here, with us this morning uh, to meet Jesus and what he wants to do in your life. We are a church that is expectant of God moving in our life and in our church. So join me in prayer as we get started. Jesus, we uh, long to be here. We long to encounter you in a powerful way. We don't want to just come. We don't want to just sit. We don't want to just listen. We want to be transformed. We want to experience, God, the power of your spirit, Lord. And we just pray right now that your spirit would fall in power on our time together. Uh, that you, God, would lead and guide and direct all of it, Lord God. You would soften our hearts, our minds, our wills, so that we might hear from you, Jesus, to say that unique word that you want to say into each of our souls this morning. We give you that, Jesus. We humble ourselves. We kneel before you. We surrender, God. We love you. We invite you into what's happened this morning. We love you in your precious name. Amen. I'm going to invite up uh, Leah to give us some morning announcements. Good morning, as Pastor John said. My name is Leah. I am the director of ARC Preschool, and I'm also the office manager here, if we have not met. Um, if you are new and joining us for the first time or haven't done this already, I want to point out to you the white card in the pocket in front of you. This is our Connect card. This is how um, you share about you with us um, so that we can connect and learn more about you. And also in that pocket is a bookmark. And this is for you to take. And this is how you can learn more about us. Um, there's some QR codes as well as some information on this. I have a few um, announcements to highlight for you starting next Sunday. Because um, it's the, no, not next Sunday, two weeks. Sorry. I'm almost done with June too fast. July 7th. Uh, we are going to start picnics in the park. And so you are welcome um, after service. Uh, bring your lunch or go grab some takeout and join um, everybody who wants to stay out in the park. Ark Park here behind the church, um, if you're not familiar with it. And just hang out with other people, eat your lunch. If you have kids, they can play. Um, just a time of good fellowship. So that is every Sunday in July and in August. Um, I also want to share with you um, something that we do, we've been doing for quite some time now, and we have a sewing camp that happens over the summer. And so if you have a child or grandchild or niece or nephew um, that is entering fourth grade or higher, we have high schoolers that join us too, um, for a week of sewing, either to just learn how to do it or improve skills if they know um, a little sewing. We have sewing machines, so you don't have to bring your own. Um, and it's just a really fun time of being creative and creating. And so if you are interested in that, um, I have you either speak to me or if you know Joy Newburn, then you can connect with her as well. And lastly, if you didn't know, we have an app. Our church has an app. And with this app, this is a great way. Um, you always have your phone with you. Right? And so the app is really a great way to stay connected with the church of what's coming up. Um, you can listen to sermons through the app. Um, you can learn more about events. You can register for events with the app. Um, there also is a, a prayer wall there, too. So if you have a prayer request um, that you would like to share with the team, that's another way that you can do it. And so go to your app store, look for Tithely Church app, or you can scan that QR code um, that is behind me in order to get set up. And if you have any little trouble, just come and see me and I'll help you out. Uh, we have one special event happening this next weekend, and I'm going to invite Hal Kimball up to share a little bit more about it. Thanks, Linnea. Oh, excuse me, Leah. Linnea's next. I'm supposed to introduce Linnea next. Okay, we're off to a great start. Anyway, our family has been truly blessed uh, that we were... Uh, given this property on Vashon Island. Actually, my grandfather established it on Vashon Island uh, back in the early 1900s, and, uh, and it's stayed in our family for uh, till now. And, uh, and it's just been a blessing, and it, through history, uh, my parents and grandparents have invited people to come and enjoy the place. And last year, uh, we had a lot of new families in our church, and so we invited uh, many of them to come over just for the purpose to getting them to know them better. And uh, it, it was a great time. 
not everyone came, but a lot did, and we just had a great time. And so we thought about that, and we thought, you know, we'd like to open it up to everybody in our church if, if you would like to come over, and we picked a day, the 29th, next Saturday, to come over from around 10 to 4, and we'll have a, you know, a picnic lunch. The details are in the bulletin, and the address is also in the bulletin. To get there, you have to, it's an island, so you have to go get on a ferry boat. And uh, it's down at Fauntleroy Ferry Dock. Uh, I think the price, I don't know, I pay a, a special rate because I get a, a bunch of tickets, but I think it's a little over $20 car driver and then for each passenger, about 4 or $5. But it's, you only pay one way. You're on an island, so they don't make you pay coming back. And so uh, there's that cost. But other than that, uh, uh, if you're new to our church or just visiting our church, we'd like to encourage you to come as well. Like I said, it's next Saturday. Uh, parking, as you come down the, the driveway, you'd be parking and facing the water. You would turn left and stall parking along there. If you're uh, young and vigorous, you can park up by the tractor barn, depending on how many people come. But we're open to having everyone come. And I looked at my uh, iPhone, and they said the weather should be pretty good. So uh, hopefully we'll have, have a good time. We would love every one of you to consider coming and enjoy us on Vashon Amp next uh, Saturday. Linnea. <laughs> Good morning. All right, so I am doing the offering prayer, and then one thing about it is that um, I know our cash app isn't working, so you can't give through that. From my understanding, you can give through Venmo, though. Um, so if you want to, you can give through that. I also know you can do the um, go through the website or just put something in the giving station. Uh, another thing, though, if this is your first time here, if you're new here, please do not feel obligated to give. Your presence here is enough. The only thing we ask of you is to fill out that Connect card. And go ahead and put it in the giving station. Um, and then with that, I'm going to go ahead and read our scripture for the offering prayer. Uh, it's from 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. And so this is just a reminder that no matter what life looks like here on this earth, we have a great inheritance waiting for us in heaven. Uh, and that ultimately we have a great and amazing and powerful God who protects us, who has saved us, who has died for us, and is deserving of all of our love and devotion. So if you'll just pray with me as we pray over our offering for this, this week. Dear Lord, I just thank you for you. I thank you that you are God who provides for us, who cares for us. Lord, I just pray over what is given today. Lord, may it be able to bless uh, your church, bless you, bring glory to you, and also serve the people of our community. May we be able to love the people around us well, love our neighbors well. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would bless it and that it would be stored well. And I just thank you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Okay, and then with that, um, so we, a couple weeks ago during Youth Sunday, I know some of you may have been like, hey, someone's missing. Um, and so this week, uh, because they weren't here on Youth Sunday, we are going to celebrate Levi Briggs, who is graduating. Um, and so, yeah, go, go ahead. <laughs> And so for those who don't know, Levi has been serving um, every, like, for consistently for years, faithfully, over in the sound booth with Russ. Um, and also, from everything I've been told, he's a man who just is on fire for God. Um, he's someone who takes his faith seriously and takes God's word seriously and his relationship with God seriously. So today we're going to celebrate him um, and wish him off well as he leaves for West Point 
Um, so with that, if Levi and his family could come on up. And so, I'm gonna. So we always give a gift. So this is for you, Levi. Um, and then, who am I passing the mic off to? Who's gonna speak? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I promised Levi I would try not to cry. So um, we'll see how. It, so I just wrote something for you. Um, so there are two verses that we have always held in our heart for you. I'm not doing so well with the no cry. <laughs> uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. I will, you will seek me and find me when you seek, with, seek me with your whole heart. And Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Levi, God's hand, as you know, has been working in your life since before you were born and continues to walk beside you and within you. God's hand kept you safe when doctors were telling us to abort you. But they didn't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know the power of prayer of an entire church that prayed for you for seven months. The doctors expected a child that would not survive three months. They didn't expect God. They didn't expect the answer to prayer. Through life's trials and tribulations, when it was said that something could not be done, you said, watch me. And with your faith, you walk through it. This dream of West Point and being a military leader and serving your country forged in, in seventh grade is now really happening for you. You will be an amazing leader, and you will have God's leading hand and, no and your knowledge that he will never let you down. We want you to know how proud we are of you and how grateful we are for the blessings you bring to our family. You're always ready with the historical backstory of current events, biblical-based opinions and thoughts, and a fun, dry humor. While you won't be here every day for us to talk to or bug you about your chores, uh, we are always here for you, praying daily for your safety and for God to use you in fulfillment of his will. We can't wait to hear your experiences and adventures, good and bad, and we are always here however you need us. We will miss your knowledge, your willingness to teach us something new, your smile and laughter, and your keen ability to debate. You are a great teacher, leader, friend, grandson, brother, and son. We will miss you greatly, but we rejoice with you on this new journey that God has placed you. Sorry, I almost made it. Okay, and then with that, we actually have someone who goes to church here who went to West Point, and so that is Chris Garceau, and he has made a video for Levi. So we're going to, don't go sit down quite yet, because we have one more surprise for you at the end, but we're going to head off to the side while we watch the video for Hey, Levi. Sorry, I can't be there to send you off. I just wanted to make this quick video for you. Uh, congratulations on all you've accomplished to get where you are. Very few people ever get an opportunity like this, and you and your family have so much to be proud of, and I know they're very proud of you. So as you know, it's about to get very real in the next few weeks, and I know exactly how nervous and excited you're feeling. The day-to-day -day will be a grind, but keep the end in mind. Always remember to lean on your faith in God and trust that it'll be worth it. It's the real deal, but I'm very excited for you. Hold your head high, brother. Always. It's a process. It won't be easy. You can count on that. But nothing worth doing is easy, and you won't regret it. So on behalf of your friends here at Arbor Heights, God bless, Levi. You got this, brother.
just needed a second. Um, okay, well, Levi, thank you for just all your years just serving Arbor Heights, being in the back and helping out. Uh, the sound booth is a much bigger job than we all, I think, give credit for. And I have enjoyed hearing all the stories about how serious you are about your faith, um, how much you just take serious the word of God. And I know God's going to use you to do great things. Um, have fun on the West Coast, where I'm from. Uh, go have Dunkin' for me <laughs> if you like coffee or just have a donut. Um, but with that, there are much greater people who have had an impact on Levi's life. And so I want to invite up Russ Barham who is going to share some last words for Levi and then close us in prayer for him. Thanks, Levi. Um, yeah, I just want to share a little story, too. Um, so I've been totally blessed, as you have been. Um, Levi stepped in and said, how can I help? And uh, so he's been helping in the, the sound booth for uh, a long time. And that's just been amazing. Um, he, he's quiet. Um, so I wanted to share a little story about him that he shared with me um, back when, you know, COVID was going around and he runs every day. He shared with me, man, and he got COVID, I think, as we all did. And he said, man, it slowed me down. I'm like, what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I run three miles every day, it's a lot of times more. But he said, it changed my speed. <laughs> and I was like, you didn't take time off? And he's like, no. <laughs> so this guy is a powerhouse um he's a powerhouse and serving too um and it was incredible to me we came up and we started teaching about how to how to serve in the booth um and the first place we started is this isn't just something to do during service um we're doing this to serve the lord um and we went to scripture and uh this man is a powerful spirit and um the lord is using him and i really appreciate that so let's pray Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the Briggs. Um, I just thank you so much for Levi. I thank you for how you've been growing him and speaking to him and using him, dear Lord. I thank you for his soft heart, and I thank you so much for his commitment. Um, continue to bless him as he goes off to West Point. Continue to move your spirit in him. Um, and I thank you and praise you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, sir. And then I'm not done. <laughs> For the service uh, here at Arbor Heights, we are focused on what the Lord is doing. And it's not just in us, but we've also been blessed with kids. We've also been blessed with other servants who are willing to teach our kids. And so let's take this time and let's pray over them. Heavenly Father, I just thank you and praise you for who you are. I thank you for the kids that you have blessed here at Arbor Heights. I thank you that we have teachers who are willing to teach them. Um, and Heavenly Father, I just pray that in this moment that there will be hearts who are ready to hear you. Um, there will be um, your word going forth and it will be transforming lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kids, you are dismissed.
is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea <clears throat> and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever.
Amen. You may be seated. Today's scripture is Ephesians 1, 15 through 19. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the Lord of our that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that I lost my place. <laughs> in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love for us, for the strength and power that you, that you love us with. Thank you for putting your love into us so that we may love through you. I ask that you would fill us with your spirit this morning and every morning so that we can love you better. In your name I pray, amen. And now we have a short video. You should pray. Father, we are the Parantu burai se bacha. Mutuman kan ketio. Yepur mahima nirantaramu nike. Amen. 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 Here and uh, a couple things I want to mention before we get going. You can uh, toss back on the lights for me there. Otherwise, I'll be in the dark. And uh, hey, so two things I want to mention. First is, if you're new with our church, we launched a capital campaign back at the beginning of this year, kind of springtime. And just a quick update on that. The main project as part of our capital campaign is putting a new bathroom on our main floor. And so we continue to make headway on that. Just so you know where it's going to be because of different uh, permit things and property boundaries, is when you come in our front door, it'll, you'll come in and make an immediate left. And so basically, if you're right there, it'll pop out of our building, and that's where the new restroom is going to be. So we are working with a general contractor, and we are getting site plans put together, uh, drawings, all that stuff. And once we get permits and everything, then we can move forward with construction, probably going to be later on in the summer into early fall. And so that's where it's at. Again, if you want to give to that, uh, we would certainly welcome that. And so that's still open if God would put that in your heart to give towards the capital campaign. Second of all, I want to mention in your bulletin this morning, you, there's an insert uh, here on the Lord's Prayer, uh, a right now media resource. We're going to be launching today into a new series on the Lord's Prayer. And again, if you're new with us, our church has a subscription to right now media which has 20,000, 25,000 plus videos. And so there is a study on there. You can learn about it more in here. Uh, a seven-part series on the Lord's Prayer. And so I want to invite you, go on there, check it out. As we go through the sermon series, you can be watching the video along with it while we do it. And so check it out. Everything is right there in that insert. The last thing I want to mention is just a heads up that I'm going to be heading out on vacation this next week. So our family is taking a road trip. Heading out, and so we'll be gone for about two and a half weeks or so, and so I'll be back mid-July. And so we've got some people in our church preaching and stepping in during that time, but just heads out or heads up, I will be out uh, for that time. So, um, all right, well, we are launching into a brand new sermon series today on the Lord's Prayer. The subtitle is On Earth As It Is In Heaven. And this is going to be a six-series, six-sermon series and because of my vacation, it won't be just all in a row. We'll kind of be broken up throughout our summer. 
but really excited to jump into the Lord's Prayer together. And we're going to unpack just kind of each verse of the Lord's Prayer and what that means for our lives. And so if you've got a Bible today, you can open it up. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. Again, Matthew chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the rack in front of you. Also, you can pop out your phone. It'll be on the screen behind me as well. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. Matthew 6, 5 through 13. I'm going to read it. Here we go. And when you pray, this is Jesus in the Beatitudes speaking. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Uh, you may recall this passage is also in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 11. We'll kind of go to there as well a little bit today, but it's in there um, also. The title of today's message is this, is From Duty to Delight. Moving from duty to delight. You know, I'm going to make a guess this morning, an assumption that the minute that I bring up prayer and that we're going to be doing a series on prayer, you might be thinking, here we go again. Another sermon series on prayer where I'm going to leave today probably feeling guilty about my lack of prayer. Or I'm going to recognize how much I ought to be praying and be told by the pastor how much I should be praying, but I'm not doing that. And so once again, it's a time of me feeling guilty about prayer. And when I think about prayer, I think if we're going to be just really honest, most of us would put prayer in the discipline and duty category, not the delight category. Right? It's a discipline. It's a duty. It's an obligation. It's kind of like when you're a kid when you have to eat vegetables. Right? It's what you have to do because it's the right thing to do and it's healthy, but you don't really like them. Right? And if we're going to get honest, I think that's how a lot of us see prayer. I have to do it. I know I should do it. The Bible tells me to do it. But if I'm going to get real, I probably wouldn't be choosing to do it a lot. And it's really hard. And it's also difficult if you're like me and my morning prayer goes something like this. Dear Lord, I'm so thankful for today. I'm so excited. Wait a minute, who's picking up the kids? Is that my wife or me? Oh, that's right. Okay, it's me. Lord, again, thank you. I just, I want to praise you for everything you're doing in my life. Wait a minute, I have to go to the bank today. Oh, okay, that's right. Okay, I'll get that. Lord, I want to pray for that person who's been, I've been struggling with. I just want to pray over them, Lord. But as I think about it, actually, they're so annoying. I'm so frustrated with that person. And then I go on a monologue how mad I am at someone. And then I, oh, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be praying. Have you been there? That's probably most of our prayer lives. That's what it's like. It's hard. It's hard to be praying like that. So I think what we oftentimes do is we either just maybe give up on prayer, just kind of relegate to the side. Uh, we kind of go through the motions. We just do rote prayer. You ever pray and you end your prayer and you think to yourself, what did I just actually pray about? Yeah, right? Uh, we go through motions. We do all these kind of things with prayer. And I wonder maybe, why is this? Why do we struggle so immensely when it comes to this piece of prayer? And I want to give us just a couple things. There's lots of reasons, but I want to give us a couple. I think one of the first ones is, as we live in a culture and we are a people who want to be immediately gratified, right? I mean, here's the deal. If you went and worked out for six months at a gym, and at the end of six months, there was no change at all. Like you didn't lose any weight, you didn't get any stronger, you were not in a better shape at all, would you keep doing it? Of course you wouldn't, you'd stop, right? And it's the same thing with prayer sometimes, is we pray and we're looking for results and they don't come and we go, eh, okay. And our prayer life kind of fades away. Uh, the obvious one you're of course thinking, of course, is busyness. Right? I mean, we're the busiest people in this generation, or busiest people, I would say, almost in human history. And so there's so many things going on. We're so distracted. And then we have these devices right here. 
right? And so you don't ever have to have a moment to yourself. And, you know, for those of you who are a lot younger than me, this is going to be really crazy. Like, it's going to be hard to get this. But um, there was a time that when you met someone at a coffee shop and you showed up early, are, are you ready for this? You had to wait. Like, like, wait a minute, like, I'm serious. You had to sit there in a coffee shop. And you're like, well, what did you do if you weren't staring at your phone? You looked around. Like, you looked at people. You looked out the window. You had to wait. It's crazy, isn't it? But now we have our phones. So we get our phones and they distract us and do all that we have with us. I think maybe a third one's this, is we're publicly faith-filled, but we're private, privately uh, f- f- fatalistic, excuse me. Publicly faith-filled, privately fatalistic. What do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. I think publicly, when it comes to prayer, we all would say, oh yeah, God is so good. God is so faithful. God answers prayer. God does all these things. But I think maybe privately, if we're honest, or at least I'm honest, sometimes I don't think prayer really works. Or at least that's how we think. I think functionally and practically, sometimes in our hearts, we love to say the right church thing, but in reality, we think to ourselves, I don't know if it actually works. I don't know if God's actually moving through prayer. So we get fatalistic. And then I think the last one's this, is that we believe our worth and value is tied to doing rather than being. Again, I think we know the right Christian answer. We know our identity is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. But then when it comes to practically living, I think we much rather would get busy doing stuff than just stop and pray or to just be with Jesus. My goal in describing prayer in this way and starting off with it is simply this, is to normalize our experience of prayer. I think so often we talk about prayer as a church and amongst Christians, like I said, it just winds up with a lot of guilt over what we're not doing. And my hope is just to normalize it, to recognize it is hard. We fumble through it. And maybe uh, the best description comes from St. Teresa of Avila, who was a nun in the 16th century who said this, when it comes to prayer, we're all beginners. When it comes to prayer, we all beginners. Amen? I don't care how long you've been a Christian, six months, six years, 60 years. When it comes to prayer, we're all beginners. But here's what I believe about every single one of us here this morning. You long to have a more powerful prayer life. I don't think you'd be here this morning if you didn't long for that deep down. I think you long to know God in a more deeper and transformative way. I think every one of us right now, secretly in our hearts, is longing for a deeper connection with God and to say, I want to be a different person. I think you long to hear more of God's voice in your life. I just, I'm hungry to hear from God. I'm hungry to hear what he has to say into my life. And I think lastly is this, you long to be used by God and to make an impact in other people's lives. I think everyone's here, you are so hungry to say, I want my life to count. I don't want to live a meaningless life. I don't want to live a life that's not going to matter and count. And I want to be used by God to make a difference in other people's lives. So here's the deal. Why don't we learn from Jesus together what it means to pray? You know, in Luke 11, when uh, the disciples are there and they see Jesus praying, this is when Jesus has the Lord's Prayer, this is what they say to Jesus. They see him praying and they say four simple words. Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And I think that's the cry for us throughout this six-week or six-session series. Teach us, Jesus, to pray. Teach what it looks like to pray with you. And so I'm going to go in Matthew 6 and in Luke 11 and kind of back and forth a little bit. And we're going to unpack this. But here's the spoiler alert, and I hope you're not disappointed in me today or sad. But actually, we're not even going to get into the Lord's Prayer today. I know, boo, right? Um, we got to set the scene. There's the part that's before you heard me read. We got to set the scene, then we'll get into it later. So let me read again for you if you forgot that first part of the Lord's Prayer. Here it was. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, Close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. 
just some quick history and culture. In that time, the Jewish people, they, there was three times of prayer during the day. 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. And what they would do is those were times you would stop wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and you would pray. Um, it's kind of like Muslims today with different times of day where they would stop and pray. And so they would, in their day at those times, 9, noon, and 3, they would stop and they would pray. And what Jesus is saying is, here's what the Pharisees would do. Is at, let's say, 9 a.m., they would be there and go, oh, Frank, that's so weird. How did we land on the most busiest intersection of Jerusalem? That's so strange. Hey, let's go ahead and pray and let's raise our hands and yell as loud as we can the most spiritual sounding prayers possible. That's what he's saying that they would do. The word that Jesus used for street in this text, there's actually another Greek word that can be used for street. One refers to an offbeat path. Another refers to like a really busy, wide public street, and that's the word Jesus uses. So it means they intentionally go find highly public, popular places to be at these times of prayer so they can look religious and spiritual. And then he says they go on babbling. So they think, if I can throw as many Bible words into my prayer as possible, if I can get as many Christianese sayings into my prayer, God is going to hear it more. And so they use all kinds of religious language and keep going on in an effort for God to hear them. Kind of reminds me a little bit, uh, about 10 years ago, we were invited over to a friend's house for dinner, our family. And they had two kids, we have two daughters. And our kids were about the same age. And we sat down at the table, there was, there was eight of us there. And uh, the other family were teaching their son, who was about seven, uh, how to pray. And, and, and the dad had told me we'd been talking about prayer and just giving him a chance to pray at dinner. So we sit down and are about ready for dinner. And his dad goes, Micah, do you want to pray for us? And Micah says, sure. And so we all fold our hands and we close our eyes and we bow our heads. And there's that silence for kind of a long time where you wonder to yourself, did that person hear that they're supposed to pray? Right, you've been there? So I kind of look up and I'm like, did, did he hear it? And then out of the silence comes this. Oh, Father! We call down your name. And I, I mean, I like shot out of my chair. And I was like, it feels like Billy Graham invaded his soul. You know, and, and he, he goes on, and I'm looking around, and everyone's still praying, and he goes, Lord, we thank you for this meal, for providing our food. We thank you for this day. We love you, Lord. In your name, amen. And everyone looks up, and I'm like, what just happened? What was that? And so after dinner, the dad and I were in the family room, and I came over to him. I'm like, man, what was that with your son at dinner? And he's like, I know, I'm so embarrassed. He's like, yes, we've been talking to him about prayer, but he's like, I think with everybody coming together, he felt like he had to really up his game. You know, like, oh, there's more people. I got to get super religious. I got to yell. I got to get really into it, you know. And that's like the Pharisees, I think. They're putting on this show, putting on this performance for the people who were there. And so that's what Jesus is talking about. Actually, Jesus refers to them, the, you know the word he used at the beginning? Did you catch that word? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. You know what the word actually in the Greek refers to? It's a word that's taken from the theater. And the word refers to someone who is an actor. Someone who's acting. Someone who's putting on a performance. Someone who's showing things outwardly that's not really real. That's what Jesus calls them. Jesus says, you guys are actors. You don't, you don't take God seriously. You're not genuine in wanting to run after Jesus or run after me or God. You're actors. He says that when they pray, he knows the word he used was to be seen. Your motivation is to be seen by other people. It's interesting because right before this section in, in Matthew is where Jesus talks about giving. And he says the exact same thing about them. He says when you give, you go out to big public places, you announce it with trumpets, and then you find the, you know, the, these money places where you put the money and you put tons of coins so everyone hears the noise of all the money that you're putting in the offering. It's all for show. It's all for acting. It's all for a performance. So what is Jesus getting at here then? Is Jesus saying that you shouldn't do a public prayer? Well, of course not, because Jesus did public prayers. Jesus prayed one time in front of thousands of people. Is Jesus saying you shouldn't pray for long periods of time or use a lot of words? Uh, Jesus one night spent a whole entire evening in prayer. So no, he's not saying that. I think what he's getting at is simply this in one sentence. To the Pharisees, prayer was about impressing God. 
To Jesus, prayer was about a, 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 a relationship with God. To Jesus, prayer was about a relationship with God, knowing God, loving God, worshiping God, serving God. It was not about a performance. And I want to unpack this a little more this morning, this idea of this relationship with God in prayer versus the performance of it. And I want to make a couple of um, uh, notes that I see in the text, both in the Matthew account and the Luke account. And um, first is the Luke one. And so in Luke 11 to 1, as I mentioned before, when the disciples come to Jesus, remember I said the first thing they say to him, teach us to pray. Okay, now you may not have caught this, but that's a really fascinating thing. And here's why. Number one, these were Jewish men. They had grown up and prayer was embedded into their entire culture. Prayer was part of everything. Prayer was, again, 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. They had been taught by their fathers to pray, taught by their mothers to pray. They had been taught by tons of people to pray. So it's really odd that they would now ask the older teach us to pray. I think the only reason for this might be is they saw something in Jesus they didn't see in the Pharisees. They saw something in Jesus that was unique in his prayer life that, that attracted, them to, uh, attracted him to them, that they said, we want to learn, we want to know what you do. Here's the second thing about it that's so fascinating. Think of all the amazing things Jesus did in his ministry. Jesus healed people who were paralyzed. Uh, Jesus went to a woman who had bleeding for years and stopped her bleeding. Jesus raised people from the dead. Jesus produced bread and uh, fish for thousands of people with only five loaves and two fish. Jesus cast out demons out of people. At one point, 2,000 demons out of one guy. All these amazing things Jesus did. And when you ask him to teach us something, you ask prayer? That, I mean, come on, isn't there something cooler you'd want to have Jesus teach you? Right? If that was me, I would never have asked about teach me prayer. I would say teach you about that healing thing. Teach me how to raise someone from the dead. Teach me how to do one of those miracles. That's what I would have wanted to be taught. So why did they say that? And here's the deal. I think the disciples were pretty smart. And I think they watched over three years with Jesus. They saw him do all these miracles, all these things, all these amazing things. But they noticed behind the scenes, there was one common thread throughout the whole entire three years. And that's that Jesus was a man of prayer. And I think they realized behind all the miracles, behind all the resurrection, behind it all, was prayer. Let me give you an example of his life, uh, Luke 5, 15 through 16. Yet the news about him spread all the more about Jesus so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Luke 6, 12. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Luke 9, 28. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. Are you noticing a pattern in Jesus' life? Luke 11, 1. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples to pray. And here's my favorite of all, Mark 1, 35 through 37. Very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off. This is Peter's house. Went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon, Peter, and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Don't you love that? All these, he's at Peter's house. The crowds are there. Uh, Jesus is there. Healing's going on. He leaves to get alone with God to spend time in prayer. And Peter and the disciples come out, and basically you hear them say, what are you doing? What, what are you, you're, you're here praying? People need you. There's miracles to be done. There's people to be helped. And you're sitting here in the forest praying. But what do you notice about Jesus' life? It's a life of prayer. Have you ever thought for a moment if you were God and you were on this earth and you were here for three years, uh, how long Jesus did his ministry, what you would be doing during those three years? You had the opportunity to help millions and millions of people. You had thousands and thousands and thousands of people clamoring for you constantly all the time. What would you spend your three years doing? I bet you'd be doing all kinds of things to help and assist people. 
But Jesus, in those three years, over and over, prioritized one thing, and that one thing was prayer. That one thing was time with God. You know, as part of this, I don't know if you noticed in the text, but uh, Jesus says it's not if you pray, but when you pray, right? Verse 5, he said, when you pray, do not be like them. Verse 6, he said, when you pray, go to your father. And verse 7, when you pray, don't be like them. When, 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 not if. It's not an if question of prayer in Jesus' life. It is a when question. And, and here's the deal. Why is this the case? Why is the case, Jesus, with this? And here's what I want to suggest. You and I see prayer as additional. Jesus sees prayer as essential. You and I see prayer as additional. Jesus sees prayer as essential. Uh, later this summer, our family is going to be heading down to Sun River, Oregon. Anybody been down there to Sun River, Oregon before? Uh, resort area down there by Bend, Oregon. And we're going to be heading down there as a family. And every other year, our family goes down there. And we go down there with my wife's family, and her sister's come, and we have a big house, and everybody gets uh, down there. So uh, about three or four years ago, we were down there. And during the week, uh, it's Bend, Oregon, so it's hot. In the day, it's up in the 90s, you know, mid-90s. Mid, uh, and we're out there biking, and uh, we're going down the river floating. I'm out playing golf. We're playing pickleball. We're active the whole entire time, running around doing all these kinds of things, right? And we are on our way back on the trip, and we're driving in the car. We just left Bend, and my daughter said something about in there, the shower, and it was a nice house we were in, and so the, the shower head was like a really nice shower, a fancy shower, it came out kind of special, and she's like, wow, wasn't that a great shower, and you guys love that shower head, and as we're sitting there, uh, they were like, yeah, we, you know, we liked it too, and they're like, dad, what did you think of the shower, and I said, well, I didn't take a shower, and my family goes, oh, like, you used a different bathroom in the house to shower, and I go, no, I didn't shower. And they're like, what? And the whole family in the car is like, what are you talking about you didn't shower? And my wife's like, wait a minute. She like almost pulls off the road. She's like, you're, you're telling us for seven days you did not take a shower. And I was like, no. And she goes, what, what do you mean? And the kids are like, you're crazy. And I was like, we got in the hot tub every night. There was a hot tub there. And, I, and my wife's like, John, you think a hot tub is like a shower? And I was like, of course it is. It's full of chemicals. And she said, wait a minute. And she had dawned on her. She said, you mean every night I was laying in bed next to you. That's disgusting. You didn't do any kind of showering at all. And she said, oh, my gosh. And my family sat there, and they were like, I couldn't believe this. And as I realized on that road, for my family, showering is essential. For me, showering's additional. <laughs> it's additional. It's, it, if it works, great, Right? Especially when I go on vacation, I kind of get my mind, it's like, shower's not needed. I just want to have fun, right? Jesus understood prayer as essential, while you and I think of it as additional. Prayer to Jesus is like air to you and me. Prayer to Jesus is like air to you and me. It's what he thrives on. It's what he goes on. And why? Why is that the case? I think it's this, is that Jesus knew he had nothing without prayer. I'll give you the capstone verse for this whole thing. John 5, 19. Here's Jesus. I tell you the truth, Arbor Heights. The son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. The son can do nothing by himself. Wow. Wow. Jesus, the Son of God, saying, I can do nothing on my own. In fact, he says another part of John, I can speak nothing on my own. I only speak what the Father's given me to speak. That is how central, that is how core prayer was to the life of Jesus. See, here's where you and I need to get. I can't do my day without God. That you'd begin your morning and you would start by saying, I can't do my day without God. I can, I can run through my stuff, but I won't do anything of any significance or meaning or value without God. I have nothing of, an, of any eternal value to say to people unless God gives me something to say today. 
I cannot love other people today without God first loving me. I cannot serve, work, collaborate, build, or help, or care for people today unless God gives me what I need. That is how essential prayer was for Jesus. See, here's what Jesus understood. Prayer is the power source for a life with God. Prayer is the power source for a life with God. Any attempt to live for Jesus in any powerful way whatsoever, any way to live for God, the only way that will happen in your life and in my life is if prayer is essential, is if prayer is at the core. Real spiritual power comes from prayer not being productive. Real power comes from prayer not being productive. Um, A.W. Tozer, and some of you have heard of A.W. Tozer. A.W. Tozer was pastor in Chicago, uh, multiple different churches for 40 plus years. Uh, get this, the man wrote over 40 books, 40 books he wrote. Unbelievably powerful man of God. One of his most famous books, The Pursuit of God. Some of you have probably read that book, The Pursuit of God by Tozer. Um, if you didn't know this, he wrote the rough draft of that book in one day. Uh, it was on a train trip from Chicago down to Texas. And literally with a Bible and a pad of paper, he wrote The Pursuit of God. It sold over millions of copies and been translated into 20 languages. What's most amazing about Tozer is this, is that his assistant pastor and other staff in his church would oftentimes go up to his office on the second floor in the back of his building, and they would go to get him for something, and they would find Tozer praying. In his office was the place that he would pray. This is what he would do. This is back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, so when he would come to his church in the day, in the work during the week, he'd wear a suit. But in his closet, in his office, he had a change of clothes, and specifically pants. And he would t take off his pants, and he would change into, they literally were called his prayer pants. His prayer pants. He would get his prayer pants on, and he would pray. And people said they'd walk in his office, and he would start on the couch, and he'd move from the couch down to the floor on his knees, and they would end up laying face down on the floor in his office for hours. And they all said as they looked at his life, they said the power behind A.W. Tozer's life was prayer. He was a man who prioritized it above anything else. Tozer said this, as a man prays, so he is. As a man prays, so he is. It's not only in the relationship, the priority of prayer, and then it's essential in our lives, but I want to suggest this other second piece too. I wonder how often we're more concerned about the right prayer than the honest prayer. I wonder how more we're concerned about getting the right sounding, uh, right doctrine prayer than the honest prayer. You know, it says Jesus talks about the Pharisees there, right? And they would babble on and on and they would do these long, eloquent prayers with all the spiritual religious vocabulary that they could muster up somehow. And Jesus at the end says, don't do that. God knows what you need. Translation, just be honest. Just be honest and say what's going on in your life. You know, 10 years ago, I walked into the QFC one morning over at Westwood Village. And it was early in the morning. It was about 6 a.m. And this was prior to me heading off to work. And I went into the QFC. And I got whatever I needed. And I, I come back out. And the way out, there is this homeless guy who's sitting on a stack of pallets right outside the door. And I passed by him, and I noticed him, but I was kind of on a hurry. And I went to my car, which was kind of right by him, and I was about to get in my car, and I just heard the Lord say, go over and I talk with him. And, you know, like you do, I'm like, no way, I'm, I'm late for work, I gotta get going. I made excuses, but I put my food in there, and God was like, go over and talk to him. And so finally, thankfully, I said, okay. So I got up, I walked over, and he's sitting there on the pallet, and his name was Kevin. And I said, hey, you know, how's it going? Pretty good. And talked for a minute, and I heard about um, him just briefly. And then I said, hey, Kevin, can I take a second and just pray, pray for you? And he said, yeah, I'd love that. And so I put my hand on his shoulder, and I prayed for Kevin. And I, I tried to give the most spiritual-sounding, best, eloquent prayer I could give for Kevin. And the weirdest thing happened. About 
uh, like 15 seconds into the prayer, it sounded like Kevin was crying. And I, I opened my eyes, and Kevin was crying. And then as he was crying, and I, I wanted to pray more, all of a sudden it sounded like Kevin was starting to pray. And so I, I was like, oh, uh, and I stopped, and then Kevin prayed. And Kevin prayed the most honest prayer I've ever heard. Kevin was praying about the loss of everything that he lost the last year. He prayed about this a girlfriend that he had that he'd lost, and he wanted her back. Kevin probably swore five, six times during his prayer. Um, Kev, but it was the most gut-wrenching, honest prayer. At the end of his prayer, he just said, God, I feel so alone. I feel so alone. And I just sat there, and God was basically saying to me, John, I had you go over here so Kevin could teach you how to pray. And we ended, and I just, I was stunned. I was shocked, and I was kind of speechless. And I walked away, and I went back to my car. God is looking for your honest prayer. You know, I've been watching a TV series right now. It's not a Christian show at all. It's just a, a, a TV series. And there's the main character in there. And he's got this struggle with God. He's kind of wrestling through uh, where he's at. And some bad things have happened in his life. And his fame is kind of falling apart. And there's a scene in the, in the show one time where he sits down for dinner. And the family will sometimes pray at dinner, but not a lot. And then he never does. But this one night they sit down and he goes, I want to pray. And the family is kind of like, okay. And so he prays and um, this is his prayer. He says, show us the way we're desperate. You made this crazy world and we don't have a clue what you're doing. Maybe you have nothing to do with this or maybe you're not even there. There's a great void between us and I'm asking you to fill that void. I'm asking you to come down and explain what's going on because it doesn't add up and I hate you for it. I really hate you for it. I don't even know if I believe in you, but I hate you. Amen. You know, as offensive and spiteful as that might be of a prayer against God, I honestly think he would prefer that over the prayer of the Pharisees. Because at least that's honest. At least that's just honest. This is what I really think of you, God. This is what I really honestly do. And I notice that God can work in that. And why? Why does God want honest prayer? Because here's the thing. You can't have a relationship if one of you is pretending. What's true with humans is true with God. A real relationship can only be built on honesty and truth, not hiding in pretense. The only way to have a close relationship with Jesus is you have to be honest. You've got to be real with where you are in life right now, what's going on in your life, what you really do think, what you're really actually walking through. You know, so often, I don't know if you're like me, I pray where I ought to be, not where I am. You ever find that? I know it's in the words I use, the way I pray. Sometimes it's, I, I pray for the John I ought to be rather than the John I am. The best advice maybe I can give is this, four simple words. Pray where you are. Pray where you are. Not where you'd like to be. Not where you think God even wants you to be. Not where you think you should be. Pray where you are. Exactly how you're feeling, exactly what's going on, pray where you are. When we don't do this, when we pray like the Pharisees did, it builds a false, a, a, a false closeness with God. We think we know God, but here's the problem for me, some of us, I know a lot more about God than I actually know God. I know a lot more theology or doctrine then I actually have an intimate, close relationship with Jesus Christ. The other problem this creates when I don't do this is it creates a secular, sacred divide in our lives. So prayer becomes this religious thing I do about the moral and good and kind of church stuff in my life, but I don't pray about the real me. Anybody there? I don't pray about the real stuff. I don't pray about the work stuff or the family stuff or the issue with my neighbor or why I'm so frustrated at this person, but I know I ought not to be frustrated, but I feel frustrated, and so I don't pray about that kind of stuff. I, I just keep it spiritual. And then it creates this, this uh, difference in my life, this separation in the, sacred, the, the, the secular and the sacred. But God wants to bring it all together my whole entire life before him and to seek him. I think what you'll find is this. 
if you pray where you are, you will eventually pray where you want to be. Let me give you a quote from Brennan Manning, who's an author, and he said this. He said, when I get honest, I admit I am a bundle of paradoxes. I believe and I doubt. I hope and get discouraged. I love and I hate. I feel bad about feeling good. I feel guilty about not feeling guilty. I am trusting and suspicious. I'm honest and I still play games. Aristotle said I am a rational animal. I say I am an angel with an incredible capacity for beer. To live... To live by grace means to acknowledge my whole life story, the light side and the dark. In admitting my shadow side, I learn who I am and what God's grace means. As Thomas Merton puts it, a saint is not someone who is good, but who experiences the goodness of God. Amen? Amen. A saint is not someone who is good, but experiences the goodness of God. Of God, When you don't get honest with God, you forfeit experiencing the grace, the mercy, the compassion, and the love of Jesus Christ in your life. When you don't do that, you don't experience the healing that God wants to do in some of your hearts today. You won't experience the power of Jesus Christ when I admit I'm weak and powerless and I need your power. I won't experience the transformation when I have to say that I don't have it together. Jesus wants to do so much in my life, but it only will happen if I get ruthlessly honest. You know, many of you know that about a month and a half ago, I lost my sister. Um, She she tragically passed away. It's a really sad story. Uh, My sister um, uh, had had an alcohol addiction for 20 plus years. And um, our family tried to get her help over and over and over and over and over, and um, it never happened, and it was just an incredibly sad, sad story, and it ended in her death from drinking, and um, there's no way to wrap a nice, neat bow around it. It's just an awful, sad, sad story, and um, as the last month and a half, I've been trying to just work through this whole thing. It's the first time I've lost someone close to me, and um, so it's been a new experience for me, but to be honest, there's, there's days uh, that I'm full of sadness, just deep sadness over it. I just can't believe it's, it's over. There's days, honestly, I'm so ticked off and angry. I'm, I'm angry at her for the life she lived. I'm angry at God for not doing more in her life. We prayed, I mean, decades for her. And I have days I just end angry and just mad. There's days I end with just apathy. Honestly, I just don't even care. I just think to myself privately, I just want to get over this. Like, I just want to be done with the whole thing. What I'm learning is this. As I get honest with God and not try to hide those feelings or hide those thoughts or hide those emotions, God's slowly healing my heart. God is slowly changing me. He's slowly working in my life as I just lay before him. Here's how I really do feel. I'm not going to try and sanitize it. This is where I'm at. And God's been working in my life. Are you being honest today with where you're at with God? Are you trying to fake things with God? Are you trying to hide certain parts of your life with God? God wants to do such an amazing work in your life and through your life, but it will only come when you get honest. I want to leave you today with, a, a course, a quote from A.W. Tozer, because we have to. He says this, Lay thy tear upon me, O God, and drive me to a place of prayer. Let's pray. God, I pray today that you would drive every single one of us to a place to say, Jesus, I cannot take another step without you. You are my only hope. You you are the only thing I have in this life, Jesus. If I don't have you, I literally have nothing. Would you breathe your life into my soul this morning? God, would you help me as I begin to get honest with you about my life, the good, the bad, the struggles, the celebrations, God, as I lay myself authentically and wholeheartedly before you, Jesus. And as I do that, Father, I thank you you meet each one of us today with compassion, with mercy, with grace, with tenderness, with care, and call us and empower us to the life you've called us to live. Thank you for modeling a life of prayer, Jesus. May you, in these next number of weeks, 
Teach us to pray like you. In your name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand and worship together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This my story. remember that no matter what comes our way, we have a hope that only comes through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen.
such boundless says this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This week, I invite you to stop. Just stop and spend some time slowing down to be with Jesus. There is healing for you. There is encouragement for you. There is change for you. There is words of wisdom for you. There is Jesus Christ waiting for you. Invite him into your time this week. Praise God. Amen. Have a wonderful week.